Hi, hi, hi. Welcome back to a brand new episode of Credit Table. And before I start my uh, my video, I would like to give a few clarifications regarding the schedule. Um, so, remember when I said that I would take a two-week long break from making any sort of videos? Well... I had a change of mind. <laughs> um, so what I instead plan to do was that uh, was that I already established a schedule. You know, in the third credit table video, and my plan is that I'm going to post a video every Wednesday and Sundays. So instead of you know, releasing like this mammoth, 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 mammoth uh, projects. Uh, I will instead post shorts and whatnot. And if it sounds like I'm a bit tired, that's because I am. It's been a long day. <laughs> so, yeah. So, essentially, I'm going to post shorts on the days that I would usually post the videos. I'm sorry if the drawing looked a bit, you know, completed. But, but you know, there, there are a few technical issues going on. I'll try to remedy that in the next drawing I'm going to do. So, this is going to be a relatively interesting process because this is my first drawing in a while where I'm not drawing Gillian Anderson or Gillian Gilbert. It's just, you know, I have different kinds of interests. That doesn't just concern Gillian Anderson or Gillian Gilbert. So, yeah, that that shows that I have a life outside of that fandom. Um, but yeah, I'm going to unleash a little bit about a little bit of my you know snobbery coming into this, and and uh, yeah. So those of you who didn't know. I'm drawing right now. You may be familiar with his name. His name is William Friedkin, and you know he's a filmmaker. And there are a few movies that of his that you may be familiar with. Um, and he's best known for French Connection. He's best known for The Exorcist, Sorcerer. To Live and Die in L.A., Cruising, Killer Joe, The Guardian, those sort of movies. Now, when I say The Guardian, I don't mean that stupid little nah, Coast Guard movie starring Ashton Kutcher. No, no, no. Yeah, it's a diff different movie, but I think also equally stupid. So, <laughs> um, But I don't know exactly what I'm going to talk about. Regarding this guy, I want to talk about French Connection and I want to talk about Exorcist, but everybody and their grandma has talked to death about about French Connection and especially um, The Exorcist. So I'm going to try and avoid that conversation. So yeah, I'm going to go ahead and talk about, you know... Sorcerer instead. So Sorcerer is a really, really interesting movie to me. It's an adaptation of The Wages of Fear. And to those of you who may be familiar with that, with that title, it's because it's, it's a novel that was already adapted by H.G. Clouseau into The Wages of Fear movie back in 1953. So what we have essentially is is that it's not really a remake of 
D53 movie, but rather a new adaptation of the novel that incorporated some of the William Friedkinisms that that he had developed over the decades that he's made movies. And now, and now for a few interesting facts. Not really interesting facts, but it's just like facts that will make you go, whoa. And, um, and this is quite weird because um, the dude is actually four years older than the Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. <laughs> dude is older than those seminal movies. <laughs> yeah, let's just say the dude had lived a relatively um eventful life um and yeah i'm gonna talk a bit about sorcerer and why it's a weird 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 movie so i first watched the movie back in 2016 and i was i was a bit confused by that movie not confused in the way that, oh, what are the themes and everything like that. Or anything like that, you know. <laughs> Having seen The Exorcist perhaps one too many times. Um, you know, we all know that William Friedkin is really interested in existential themes and, you know, and cynicism and whatnot. But... This is the first time that I saw a movie that I think is trying its best to be as nihilistic as possible. Wow, this movie. <laughs> it's not enough that it's misanthropic. It's downright nihilistic. And I guess I should explain a little bit of the plot to some of you viewers out there. So, the, so essentially, the plot of the movie is that we have these four brand, bands, of, these four, 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 four criminals had to band together to carry nitroglycerin to an oil rig that exploded following riots in the capital of Colombia. Yeah. It sounds about as straightforward as it as it possibly can. So how is the night how are they going to carry the nitroglycerin? Well you can't take it up in the air because there would be too much of a risk of it exploding in midair and, you know, and you you will waste lots of resources trying to carry that thing over the air and ended up and it ended up you know blowing up yeah so essentially helicopter meets bomb equals explosion equals wreck equals lots of wasted money and um so the only way they could go about this was that they have to, you know, ask for people to go about and carry the thing using trucks. But no same person is going to take on the challenge short of pure desperation of wanting to get out of the slum that they are in. And guess who are the people that wants to get out of the slums? more than the actual people living in the town of Porvenir. Exactly the criminals. And all the criminals were there for different sorts of crimes, but really they went there because they want to lay low and, you know, make sure that their crimes got into enough of an obscurity that they could go in and return to their hometown. 
they, they could sneak out and you know go to their hometowns and you know th this is going to be a big money you know item and anybody who carries that thing is going to get a lot of money and so money is also a major factor because they they just don't want to eat plantains anymore <laughs> for for lunch and so the four criminals consist of a banker a mafia robber and a terrorist and did i mention banker i already mentioned banker right? and a straight up assassin yeah <laughs> so the so you have these four people from different you know from different courts of life trying to escape this town that they are in and yeah that ended up being the driving force behind why they wanted to band together and carry the nitroglycerin and split the money and if possible get the hell out of the town it's not going to be easy you know it's essentially described as an almost futile expedition because the jungle had lots of bumps and everything and they have to be really careful and there there is a huge possibility that by the time they got to the place the fire would have been either too severe to to carry out the initial plan, which is to use the nitroglycerin to create sort of like an equilibrium of heat and it would help dissipate the fire or the fire would have been taken out and, you know, their services were no longer acquired. Sorry, required. So they went through hell and back to get this thing done. They went through storms they went through blockages and also the idea of being cooked up with one another inside of a van that's, that doesn't really fit them enough as is and then you add to that you know some really 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 unstable nitroglycerin to really help ratchet up the tension between all the people that that was involved in this, you know, massive, massive, massive bull guano. So that was the plot of Rages of Fear in a nutshell. Or at least Sorcerer. So, Sorcerer to me is a really interesting movie. Uh, and I've used this analogy to describe the movie in that, you know, this movie is great. But it felt like I was promised a three course meal and you know I was I was barely done with my second course when the restaurant abruptly caught fire and that I have to leave all my food there. That's this movie in a nutshell. It's way too short for the kind of ambition that it was in. It was weird. It's a weird movie because uh, otherwise the movie is fine. But it was way, 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 way too short. The movie ran. The movie ran at a runtime of two hours and one minute. While the original HG Kuzo version runs for almost three hours. And I felt like the movie Sorcerer would have definitely benefited from that sort of runtime. Because I really want to feel like, you know, I really want to feel the tedium of the journey. It, it's a weird thing to ask for a movie, but in this movie, does something really, really well is that 
really does a great job at, uh, you know, at establishing stakes. Like, as mentioned before, all four of these people are criminals. You know, Amidu is a terrorist who blew up Jerusalem. And Bruno Kramer is a corrupt um, banker who was involved in, like, number fudging and whatnot. And, and when his cousin committed, you know, the S word, he promptly left France. And then you have, you know, Francisco Nadal, who, sorry, Francisco Rabal, who played this assassin, you know, who promptly went into hiding after, you know, committing the crime. And then, of course, you have Roy Scheider, who who is a robber for a different mafia family, you know, robbing a church that was fronted by a different mafia family. So he's basically, you know, he, he's basically the most wanted man in all of, you know, the five boroughs, essentially. So all these people have different sort of motivations. Um, Bruno Premier might be the least hardcore of all of them. Mainly because, you know, he's just a banker. He's just a banker, but he's been involved in really shady dealings and stuff. So, and then, of course, his cousin just had to commit the S-word and, you know, and, you know, because of the timing of the act and, and the charges leveled, leveled against him, yeah, it, it's much wiser to just leave the country and live in hiding for a bit before the crimes, you know, went into obscurity. There was this one scene that everybody and their grandma had told, has said, oh, this is one of the best scenes to, to ever be dedicated to, to celluloid. And that is the, um, the rope bridge scene. You know, it's in all of the, um, it's in all of the, promotional footage it's a poster art for the movie um, and I have some gripes regarding the sequence not that the sequence itself is bad per se it's not horribly executed or anything like that it's just that much like the rest of the movie it felt chopped up it felt hacked to bits yeah. Again, it's a victim of the film's runtime. Films, the film should have run a bit longer. Same goes with the thin red line. The thin red line should have been much longer, and the message would have been like far more crisp and clear. I feel. I feel like both of these movies ended long before they could properly hit the message across. You were, you were watching a movie expecting that the main point of the movie be, to be right around the corner and then all of a sudden we cut to the end of the movie and I was like, huh? We're, wait, what? Uh, wait, a few minutes ago I was watching a movie, 
And I'm looking at the credits. Huh? <laughs> and it all had something to do with the fact that, you know, with the fact that the journey felt really, like, tr trimmed down. I want to feel the absolute misery of going through this mission. I want to feel it coursing through my veins. And it barely gave me any. <laughs> I mean, we went... And also, the structure of the movie is weird. The first half of this movie... It's not even the first half. The first act of this movie, I feel, is much longer than the other two acts of the movie. <laughs> it's weird. It's like we're not halfway through act two and then we're already in the denouement? Wait, what? And I felt like... I, I know the whole point about this movie is that it had this existential angst. It's edgy, you know, life sucks and then you die kind of quality. But at the same time, I felt like some of the deaths came off too abrupt. Like, again, a few minutes after we went through the rope bridge sequence, we immediately cut to the sequence where they had to blow up a tree that was blocking the way. That felt like such a de-escalation of the of the stakes. You know, or perhaps I'm remembering this a bit differently. But I just saw it the, earlier today and I think that yeah, I was right. The, this eerie intense sequence featuring nitroglycerin and wanting to blow up the tree came out after the rope bridge sequence and I was and it felt like wait what we went through we went from going through this rope bridge and then having this you know torrent of death swirling around beneath you and we cut to this relatively serene shot i was like that sequence it's that the sequence is fine but why was it edited that way it doesn't feel like an escalation of the of the stakes it felt like it it decreases the, the, the stakes. And then after that, a few minutes passed. And then... And then, you know... Bruno Kermer and... Amidou is driving in the same car. And they were talking about... You know... And they were talking about what lives they lived and he was showing all of the you know the locket that he planned to give his wife prior to you know escaping for Porvenir. a few moments later not not i think it's even a few seconds later the the truck suddenly flipped and then Wait, Bruno Kermer is dead already? Wait, what? Okay? It was weird. The, the, the way it juggled the sequences is weird. Like I said, the movie should have been longer. It really should have been longer. Usually, I beg movies to be much, you know, shorter. Not this movie. This movie, I sincerely believe that if it was three hours long, it would have been, you know, 
Friedkin's masterpiece. Instead, what we got is a two-hour movie with brief glimpses of brilliance, but also really shoddy execution. Like I said, I don't have, I don't hate the movie, but it, again, that runtime, that runtime really, 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 really betrayed the movie in the long run. And of course. There's also the fact that the movie cost $22 million in 1970s money. My goodness, that was a lot of money to burn. <laughs> like, fun fact, this movie actually cost more than Star Wars, and it made less than Star Wars by a lot, by a wide margin. <laughs> so you have this... Twenty-two million dollar movie, starring Roy Scheider and some other loser being cooped up in in a, in the jungles of Colombia in a truck, or they could go and watch an eleven million dollar movie where they transported you to space and to different worlds, you know, and you have Alec Guinness there, you know, and it's fun and not the not nihilistic at all. If you were the typical audience members, of course you're going to go watch Star Wars. It's almost funny that that the movie came out within the same year. This movie felt like it should have come out a few years earlier. It should have come out in 74, 75, something like that. Instead, it came out in 76 when blockbusters really started to gain traction. And of course, this flop, so this marked kind of like the end of that era of filmmaking where, you know, where directors have like carte blanche to do whatever the hell they wanted. And then, in 1980, Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate all but ruined that, you know, all but brought that new Hollywood filmmaking to an abrupt, violent end. But, you know, this movie helped mark the beginning of the end. And then 1941 came out and it signaled another trend like maybe we shouldn't give these directors, you know, way too much money and way too much power because it's not going to be a guarantee we'll get the money that we is, we expected of them. Seventies man, they were <laughs> the seventies movies are just different kinds of beasts. The world felt like it was in a different universe entirely. And here I am spoken as if I've lived through the 70s. <laughs> I'm not. I'm just like... Comparing the movies that they make now, and how interesting the actors are, when you compare it to now, it's just... Uh, it's like a pale imitation of a pale imitation. Yeah, so that sums up my feelings for... For a Sorcerer. It really should have been longer. That being said, there were a few things about this movie that really got it right. I love how dirty the town felt. I, I, I love how in every inch of the frame, I felt like I'm covered in grime and sweat. It, it's a miserable film to watch. 
And if you watch it during a particularly hot summer day, where the humidity is at an all-time high, you really will feel like one of the characters. This is a movie that just that just dares you to be in a bad mood watching it and dares you to continue to be in a bad mood after you watch it. And the ending. Oh yeah, I forgot to talk about the ending. The ending kind of posits that after all the bullshit that that, you know, Roy Scheider went through, he ended up being killed by one of his associates. Yeah, that's that's a movie that really will really wants you to feel like utter garbage by the end of it all. By the way, I'm recording this video on Tuesday night. What time is it? It's currently ten twenty two PM. Yeah. So, Buyakacha, I guess. <laughs> Let's just hope this session doesn't last longer than it needed to be. <laughs> so, yeah, let's talk a thing or two about my strategies here. So, I don't know exactly how I'm going to make shorts. I really don't know. <laughs> Not in the manner that, okay, I don't know how to edit and all that kind of stuff. I, I already explained that, but rather, how do I approach it? Because really, I felt like there are only one or two ways wherein I can approach this, this short. I could either do a full Julia Gisela um, style short where I fast forward through some of the process by showcasing the highlights of all the process. Or I show just little tiny glimpses of the process in a similar manner that, you know, Victoria Kagalovska um, uses, sorry, utilizes for the shirts. I don't know which end I'm going to end up on. I'm maybe skewing towards Julia Gisela or something like that because I want my shirts to be able to stand on their own, you know, all that kind of stuff. But given the deadline that I set for myself, I'm really tempted to just pull the Victoria Pergolovska and just show you like little gl glimpses into my process and all that kind of jazz. But then if I'm doing a Julia Gisela type uh, video, I have to show my face. And let's just say that I look like a uh, hot garbage. So, yeah. Yeah, I, f I feel positively 17 years out of date compared to all these other major creators. Yeah, I, I don't really need to compare myself to, to other, you know, artists. God, I... God, I... I couldn't even say artist without, you know, cringing a little bit from all the, from the pretentious connotation that comes with 
Who am an artiste? Kind of thing. It's, ugh. But really, let's, let's boil it down. I really want people to watch my content. And yet my content felt like it was positively 17 years out of date. You know, all these other creators, you know, you just look at Victoria Kagalowska. Okay. She, her, a lot of her long form videos isn't just live streams. You know, there were like co coverage, you know, and the footage that she utilizes is in full pristine full 4K. Compare that to me, that you know, it, it's just nothing more than than you know a live stream that I'm just way too busy and lazy to be completely honest and afraid to you know to edit into really interesting pieces and tidbits. The drawing came out looking wonderful. Yeah, yeah, you can't go wrong with drawing William Friedkin. William Friedkin had simultaneously one of the easier faces to draw for a filmmaker, but because he kind of looks like that one uncle of yours that's perhaps a bit too intense for his own good, but at the same time, is somebody that you definitely want to pick away at his brain. I gotta say, for somebody that's nearing 90, dude looks remarkably good. He looks like he's only in his 70s. Anyway, back to ruminating about my, you know, insecurities and whatnot. <laughs> um, yeah, but you compare my my content with again Victoria Kozlovska's videos. She manages to attract that much of an audience. Mainly because, you know, she put lots of effort into it. I don't even have a, a 4K camera. And, you know, my videos are essentially live streams that I posted on to the internet. Now, not that live streams don't require any effort or anything like that. You know, but at the same time, I also cannot deny that compared to all these other creators, they put a lot of effort into it. So that that's why I'm taking a two week break from from making these long form videos. Yeah, if I if I ended up having half the subscriber count that Either Julia Gisela or uh, what do you call this? Victoria Kagalowska managed to cultivate for themselves. I would be a very very happy man. Oh, yeah, I completely forgot about this one other art creator by the name of Alana Claire Art. Uh, I think she's focusing mainly on her online store now because, you know, 
because it's been a year since she last uploaded on YouTube and either YouTube is really not friendly towards you know art channels or she found a better calling you know just selling art through her stores and all that kind of stuff either way I wish I wish her the best because Alana is kind of a sweetheart <laughs> I've interacted with her on social media uh, on a few account um, this isn't like well, Alana Claire are exposed types of videos uh, it's not it's not but I'm just giving a little bit of a context as to you know what sort of relationship I had with Alana it's simply you know the kind of friend the kind of relationship you'd expect from a content creator and a fan. Just being mutually cordial to one another. You know, I, I, I don't I don't see myself as like anything special or anything like that. Uh, we, we just interacted on on social media and on YouTube a couple of times. And a lot of times we interacted with one another it's nice it's she she's nice and cordial and I returned the favor by being nice and cordial to her and I've actually made a few fan art of hers you know, one of which sees her you know eating ice cream and you know she likes it she, she gives it a like she shared it on her YouTube channel not on YouTube, sorry, sorry, she, she shared it on her social media accounts, but, you know, apart from that, you know, that, that was the extent of my interaction with her, but, you know, my interaction with her was nice. It's really, really nice. For the longest time, I've been wondering... If I'm a YouTuber, what kind of YouTuber am I going to be? You know, I certainly cannot be a movie reviewer because that sort of boat has long, long sailed. I mean, really think about it. Um... All the original pioneers of the movie review genre on YouTube it eventually moved on to bigger and better stuff. And none of their contents, well, except for Jeremy Johns, um, ended up feeling like the way they feel. End up feeling, end up feeling different. You know, it it, it hits different now that decades have passed since the the great wild west of posting movie reviews on YouTube. You know, you you can't you can't pull a Chris Tuckman, Jeremy Johns anymore because Jeremy Johns has if all effectively turned that into a career if he if he did something anything remotely different I don't think he would get half as many tractions as he possibly could you know and Chris Stockman has now moved on to filmmaking and whatnot instead of talking about film he ended up making films now which I'm happy for the guy, you know. But the era of standing in, f of sitting in front of, you know, some backdrop and talking about your thoughts of, of a movie felt like an 
old niche now. Like there are only only a handful of creators that could pull off that kind of thing anymore. And I don't think I'm one of those people that's interest that could hold enough of an interest to just sit in front of some backdrop and then state the opinions that I have on the, on the movie. You know, I, I don't have that much of a com command over the audience. And now we move on to a different kind of video making. You, you can either start a commentary channel, which is exhausting to run because, you know, some Sometimes you get to tell some really good, wholesome news, but most of the time you're just dealing with, you know, narcissists being narcissists, and then you get, like, DMCA'd and get YouTube picked down and all that kind of stuff, so I, it was, it, it was rough. <laughs> it's rough to get that kind of thing going. That's why people who run these, you know, these commentary channels are, you know, a bit unhinged, or at the very least become really, really well versed in editing at a relatively young age. Uh, I'm old, I'm a bit older than a lot of the big creators that that are part of the YouTube, you know, commentary community, you know, I, I felt like, I felt like a boomer compared to those people, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, that's that. And, of course, there, there are the video essayists, you know, those crazy, crazy bunch of people that could go on and on and on about certain subjects for, you know, an hour and a half. And the right opinion is perhaps one of the maddest YouTubers I've ever seen because he managed to do, like, a four-hour-long, you know, a four-hour-long video regarding Nikocado Avocado. That, that thing... That was an insane amount of work that I, since, with all due respect, simply could not be bothered to kind of create, you know? Unless I have the proper gear and whatnot, then I will do it. But like I said, I don't have the proper gear. I felt like 17 years out of the loop, <laughs> you know? And, of course, you have your LS Marks, who ended up making nine-hour-long videos, seven-hour-long videos, ranking every single episode in a long-running series. Ew. The work, man, the work. <laughs> the, the amount of work that these people have made, man, oh my god. And here I am, doing... You know, just doing things that are 17 years too late. Yeah, I should have. I should have been involved in YouTube much earlier. But also, I'm a stupid child who probably couldn't handle the pressure of doing that. So maybe I'd go insane or something. I don't know. I'm kind of glad I'm pursuing it now, but at the same time, I don't know how this is going to pan out for me. Yeah, so, yeah, we'll see where this goes. If I get, if I get half the engagement that Julia Gisela or Victoria Kagalowska ended up getting, I'd be a happy, 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 happy man. <laughs> You know, even if it meant making less money than a lot of these other YouTubers. Yeah, 
I've seen, I've seen fan, Jillian Anderson fan channels that put in more effort than me in terms of editing. So, so the, the, let's face it, I'm not going to be Mr. I'm high on my own farts. <laughs> you know? You know my shortcomings, I'm trying my best to kind of rectify that. I saw a video by Alicocha earlier today that talks about Brazilians and how YouTube is essentially a place where you build Brazilians. You have to be borderline stubborn, you know, holding on to your dreams until you got lucky and then you, your videos got pushed into the algorithm and you, know, you get gain traction and maybe just maybe you can make money out of it. That that's my ultimate end game really. I want to be able to make money off of my passions. What time is it, May? Twenty two forty two. It's been twenty minutes. Of me spewing drivel. <laughs> My goodness. You're currently watching some boring sod doing shading in the most boring way possible. So, hi, welcome <laughs> to my channel. I feel like this is the one thing that differentiates me from other YouTubers, really. The, the willingness of showing you some of the tedium that goes into making art. Sometimes it doesn't work and I probably, you know, let out a wail of, like, frustration for shutting up the stream or something like that. Maybe I could do that, but, you know, I also want there to be edited videos on my channel, <laughs> you know? Nobody's gonna want to watch a four hour long video wherein a guy talks in the most monotone way possible talking about nonsense and watching just shade a video shade a drawing or a video we're halfway through honey all I have to do is do this end right here all I have to do is do this end of the bargain here because I like it dark somewhat. So, yeah. By the way, um, the time that I mentioned, uh, the date and, sorry, the time and days in which I upload is subject to Malaysian time, so you might want to adjust that according to your country's time.
doop 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 Yes, people, this is the reality of doing art. <laughs> to the outside world, it's kind of tedious looking, but for the people actually doing the shading, it's actually the most nerve-wracking and adrenaline pumping thing you, you, will, you could ever do. This is look this is looking pretty good. Yeah, I I'm having little to no gripes with how my drawings turned out. But I will warn you that if I ever got a drawing that just wouldn't work out, I will you know let out a whale of frustration before leaving the stream. <laughs> Not really leaving the stream, but ending the stream. Yeah, that's that's a more apt description of the kind of thing that I would do. Just know but that if I ever showed some sort of anger, it's never directed at you, my dear viewers. It's just my frustration at the process. Yes, those are indeed glasses, how do you know? But those aren't sunglasses, by the way. Those aren't certain sunglasses, those are just aviator glasses. Yeah, regular glasses, essentially. Really clear, really clear glasses like this. Yeah, clear glasses throughout. I forgot to wear my glasses, my goodness. <laughs> no wonder my eyes felt really, really dry. I'm doing the bottom portion of the drawing first because it looks much shorter than the tedium that is on this side right here. I'm doing this to keep myself sane. <laughs> if I keep working on the top portion here, I will rip my hair out. I love this pencil, man. I hope nothing bad after happens to you. Because my god, you are one of the smoothest, smoothest pencils I've ever worked on. simpler it is if you just focus at the tiny thing at the bottom. Simple, isn't it? God, I wish I'm listening to Make It Riley's Tears in the Rain right now. I could really use that it's like an accompaniment, yeah. The boredom is really starting to kick in. Mm -hmm. 
despite mm, despite what I said about viewership and whatnot, you know, the fact that anybody is actually watching this and, you know, and just couldn't come up with any kind of comment on it, I, I would like to say thank you. I really, I really thank all of you for it. At the very least, watching this. What else can I say? I just like my background's really, really dark. It's weird to think that Sorcerer and Star Wars and Penny Hall are the same age. <laughs> wow. Just wow. And it's even weirder to think that a movie could be as old as an actual adult. <laughs> oh man. This stuff looks really, really, really intense. The, there were quite a lot of stories about his behavior on the set and why he's called Hurricane Billy during the making of you know, Sorcerer. I haven't read the full freaking connection book yet, so I really cannot tell you what sort of interesting things that he had gone himself into. But he seems to be, outside of his working, you know, working mode, he seems like a genuinely funny, albeit still kind of intense guy to be with. He's not the guy, kind of guy that will, you know, entertain small talks. At least that's the impression that he gave to me. But his anecdotes are really, really fa funny and fascinating. There's a there's a weird anecdote about the making of Sorcerer, and it had something to do with the making of the rope bridge sequence. Uh, the funny thing about it was that was that when they were making the movie, they've already included that sequence into the script. But while they were location scouting, they found out that the rivers that they were looking for are bone dry. So they had to move several thousand miles to find the perfect river and they actually found the river but then a couple of months later the that river also dried up so in a move that i could only describe as nature man versus nature he ended up just tapping the low he ended up tapping the local river and pumping in water into that the same bad bedrock that ended up being the the site where they filmed the rope bridge sequence <laughs> if that's not hollywood i don't know what to tell you, you know, people just playing god People essentially throwing exorbitant amount of money to play God. 
Hey, we. But hey, it, if it looks good on screen, it looks good on screen. You know. But yeah, I felt like even William Freakin would have appreciated the absurdity of that notion. Like, we're, we're throwing lots of money to do essentially God's work. We are almost done. All that's left is to add a little bit of a bouquet effect to that to that little circle there. And by bouquet effect, really I meant just add some, you know, shade of gray surrounding the halo. I like these sort of stark backgrounds, you know. It conveys so much. What time is it now? Oh, we're two minutes shy of 11 p.m. My god, tomorrow is going to be hell. Ah, <sighs> It's almost done. This is literally only exciting for me. <laughs> Don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. You can tell the the tempo of my scratching is getting higher and higher.
I'm gonna add gradation to this to the halo and we'll maybe smooth out some of the shading here. Maybe add a little bit of shading to this area here. Add some from density to it. And voila. It's not half as good as my Gillian Anderson drawing. That that drawing is literally my masterpiece. But this is good. Yay! Ah, <laughs> uh, yay! Oh, the gradation looks amazing. <laughs> my God. Okay, I'm going to add my signature now. Ooh! Look at it! Looks so good! Oh yeah? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, look at it. Look at it! I'm so happy! <laughs> Ooh, man! Yeah. Um, thank you for watching my video, and, um, yeah, I'll see you soon. I'll do a little bit of a fixer opera on this drawing, you know, but that's about it. Yeah, thank you for watching. Um, we, we, we had another relatively productive session and I'm gonna go to sleep now because uh, tomorrow I have a presentation tomorrow so take care